How much fertilizer do we really need? The Soil Health Field Day at the farm of Dave Brandt over in Carroll, Ohio on April 5th, 2017. Coverage sponsored by Buckeye Soil Solutions, Agco, Mayor Farm Equipment, United Landmark LLC, Will Rogers Entertaining Speaker. Introducing Buzz Clute from the University of South Carolina. Speaking on, no, but seriously now, how much fertilizer do we really need? All right, uh, you have no idea how intimidating is, it is to follow Gabe Brown and Ray Arbacheta. So just to sort of uh, get, get me okay, can everybody say Arbacheta? No, 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 Arbacheta! No, you guys, Arbacheta! That's my man, Ray. Okay, sorry. So, all right, I'm, I'm going to... I'm going to start off with a story, or, or just a couple of things. Um, I am an aquatic scientist. Can we keep the lights on just for a second, please? I'm, uh, I'm originally, I'm kind of a recycled chemical engineer. I started my career, worked 12 years on a uranium mine, really environmentally friendly stuff, <laughs> and uh, came to came to the United States. I, I, I met and married a, a, a girl from Camden, South Carolina 30 years ago. And we came to the United States um, and I got a degree in, in aquatic sciences uh, and, and started working in water and suddenly discovered how incredibly it was frustrating it was because all you're measuring, all you're doing is you're measuring this water, this water that's already dead. So uh, you, you're equating, you know, I equate myself to a coroner in, in the medical professional. The, the, in the medical profession, because the coroners are the guys who determine cause of death. And I met Ray Arbacheta one day in 2010. <laughs> His name's not Archuleta, it's Arbacheta. Okay. And, and he started talking to me, Oh, those mycorrhiza fungies, I'm so excited, Buzz. New things happening here, mycorrhiza, you know. And... And I, this guy's lost his mind. <laughs> you can relate to that, right? And, and, uh, but, but he started talking to me and he said, Buzz, all our, you know, you've, he's already, you know, our, our lakes and rivers are filled with yesterday's conservation plans. And those, that, you know, field borders and filter strips, those are diaper practices. And I'm going... And he's taught, we can change the soil, we can he heal the soil. And um, it took me about an hour and a half with Ray to realize that we were on something. From that day onwards, I never looked at another aquatic sciences project again. I'm still supposed to be a, an aquatic scientist, but I, I basically, I fell in love with soils from that day onwards. Um, let me tell you another story. Um, th about three or four years ago, I still believed that our land grant uh, recommendations had a foundation in truth. <laughs> and, 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 I, and I wrote to my, uh, but I, I, I was looking at so, some of the data we had and it didn't quite match up. So I wrote to the land grant university, the lab, and I said, do you have the yield response curves for cotton, corn, wheat, and soybeans for potassium and phosphorus? And she wrote back and she said, no, we, we don't have those. I said, well, you know, where's the original data come from? Uh, you know, did you have it on soils that were tilled, high organic matter, low organic matter? Did you have averages? She said, no, we got them from Pennsylvania and um, Georgia and another place. And I'm going, that's what our soil fertility recommendations are in South Carolina. Um, and, and I was actually stunned. Um, and then we, um, I belonged to, uh, I, I was at a, at a meeting where a very distinguished professor uh, of the land grant university, he's an emeritus professor now, uh, there's a table that we have in our fertilizer recommendations, high, medium, low, or low medium, high, low, medium, sufficient, high, very high, and excessive. And I said, uh, Virgil, where do these, where do, how, what's the scientific basis for these, you know, for these categories? 
And he said, well, Burr's, you know, the Bible was only written about 3,000 years after, you know, the, um, Adam came along. And, and I, I just kind of stood there stunned because he said, Buzz, there's nothing like that. So this has been sort of a tradition that's passed down and passed down as science. Now, I'm sure somewhere along the line the research happened, but that was kind of... Um, it was, it was, I was quite stunned because uh, these guys just really didn't make any attempt at, at uh, defending that. And then I went to Walmart one day and I found this t-shirt. And the t-shirt, can anyone see that? Can, can you, Greg, can you see that? It says, no, you're right. Let's do this thing the stupidest way possible because it's easier for you. And that's, and that's been my experience, guys. I mean, we've, I've just gotten over trying to get my mind around this nutrient management thing, and these jokers come up and say we don't use it anymore. <laughs> right? <laughs> We're starting to find in some of our lighter soils, well, why is it not coming up? You know, what, what's happening to the stand? The stand's not coming up, or it's coming... Oh, residual herbicide. What in the world are we doing, guys? So... Um, I, you know, being a, a recycled aquatic scientist, I'm a real uh, no, uh, 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 novice in this, and, and I sometimes wonder, because I don't know if you know about South Carolina, but we are not an ag school. I am the ag school at the University of South Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a pretty sorry state, I promise you. So... This is, this is kind of where we are. I'm really sorry my partner and friend Carl Coleman couldn't come along because he and I um, have, have gone on this journey together. Uh, just a preface to all of this, all of the research we've done has been on cover cropped fields. Basically, most of our rotations are corn, wheat, soybeans, uh, and typically what we've been doing is corn followed by a warm season cover crop. Uh, of about two months, and then wheat, which is then uh, double cropped with soybeans the following year, and then we put in a, a cool season cover crop. And I think I'll talk about, but uh, again, I think what uh, I think what Gabe was saying, you know, don't don't try this until you you've got a system that's already working and wean your soils off it. Although I would say that in many cases, I think the weaning is not happening in the soils. I think the weaning is happening in the mind of the farmer. So, no, but seriously, how much fertilizer do we really need? Um, and, and basically what's happened is soil health, you guys are responsible for messing up our fertilizer recommendations because soils, when they are living and active, just mess that all up, okay? And, and if, of course, well, it's, it's, it's allowed me to do a little bit of work. And for me, it began... Uh, again, this is something that Ray instigated uh, five or six years ago, uh, four or five years ago. Conservation Innovation Grant, City Roots, um, they produce about 20,000 pounds of produce from one and a half acres. And if you have a look, this is our fertilizer recommendation for in this part of the world. So conceivably, you could be putting 125 pounds of nitrogen 240 pounds of K2O, P2O5, and 200 pounds of K2O on that land uh, to produce, uh, to produce the, uh, the, the, the vegetables that you need. Well, uh, let, let me show you the fertilizer program for these guys in the last five years. Okay, it's like, okay, these guys are doing something different over here. Um, and uh, this is soil that was uh, um, um, municipal... Um, compost, which was piled about eight inches, and what we did, we, we went and did a project with them going no-till at City Roots, because they noticed the tillage was just eating up their organic matter. So um, what I noticed over there was, uh, I didn't do pounds per acre or anything, I just sort of started at a baseline. Over three years, basically what I noticed was, one of the things I was, so, oh, organic matter, you know, you've got to adjust for pH all the time. Well, do you see what your pH did? It was kind of rock steady, right? It really didn't change over that time. For the phosphorus, oh, you know, you, you, you're taking all those, that phosphorus off with the vegetables. Well, goodness gracious, the phosphorus actually went up. What's going on with that? That's three years. 
And then the potassium, I said, whoa, potassium's going down. We had a huge rain year here. So we had a lot of moisture going on, and I was freaking out. You've got to put something on there. And they were sort of trying to source uh, wood ash. And, and then all of a sudden, it started turning on its own. And it's like, what in the world? Is it my you know, measurement? Am I sampling right? You know, did I sample at the right depth? But that was the first start of it. And then we got another conservation innovation grant. NRCS employees, put up your hand. Thank you, guys. Okay. <laughs> We've, we've, we've uh, done a lot with conservation innovation grants. Five farm fields in three different counties in South Carolina, about 60 acres altogether, and we started cover cropping, and we started with uh, cool season cover crops. And basically, all of those fields have seen about um, uh, a, a diversity of about 14 to 15 species, and there's, I don't think uh, they've ever gone for a period of more than 30 days where they've had some kind of live root in the soil. Um, and uh, essentially, um, what we had was 13 management zones, and we had uh, yields that were up and down uh, uh, and not necessarily in that order. But uh, this is what we found. Um, we had some fields that had been manured, one field that was manured uh, three, three years in a row, some that had, not be, uh, uh, that had been manured just once or twice. But I put the manured and the unmanured fields in there. But notice no lime, commercial phosphorus, or potassium over that time. And essentially what we found was our soil test pHs started rising. And not adding lime in that part of the world, it, basically we've got really sandy soils, and then we hit uh, what is known as an argillic horizon, usually at about 8 or 10, 10 inches. Nothing happened, you know, so our, our pH is starting going up. Our, our soil test phosphorus, basically up and down, not necessarily in that order. Uh, increased a little bit where we had manure, but dropped about 15% over three years. Uh, soil test potassium um, also dropped a little bit, somewhere between 15 and 20%. And then our organic matter started going up. Now you've got to understand, we were working with the experts there, and the experts told us, listen, we tried cover crops 30 years ago. They don't work, you know. <laughs> All right, and listen, we, our soils are too sandy, and our climate is too hot, you will never have organic matter. Look what happened to our organic matter over three years. Now that's not spectacular. What is that, 30, 20%? That 20 to 30%, or 30% around about. So that's not spectacular, but it's way more than the experts had said. So the experts have been very condescending. Well, you don't have data. Soil health is not scientific. You know, this is stupid. You're wasting your money. Your, your farmers, you know, the farmers are stupid. They were ridiculed. So we, we, we got this. Guess what happened at the end, you know, two years into this? The guys were saying, we call them the itty bitty shitty committee. Okay. <laughs> All right, the itty bitty shitty committee said, oh, well, this is not real science. This is just observational. Okay, so, all right. So, okay, before we do that, before we talk about the Itty Bitty Shitty Committee, um, this is an interesting sort of, again, this is just anecdotal that it's not scientific, okay? Here we go. This is Sonny Price's field, and there he'd cover crop. That's about 10 acres over there. And then uh, he, he called me up. He said, Buzz, Buzz, look what I got here, man. And so he, he gets real excited. He says, Buzz, I ain't been excited about farming like this for 20 years. So, but look, here's where his cover crop was. Uh, the rest was cotton, and um, he put cover crop on that. And this is what it came back. These are his lime recommendations, and these are his lime recommendations in the CIG. Kind of a coincidence, isn't it? Sort of convenient. All right, so amazing. Okay. Crop removal. You, you've got to replace what your crop removes, right? Isn't that so? I mean, otherwise, like, you're going to mine your soils. Well, we get that from the, uh, the fertilizer guys over there and, and the extension guys. So we did a little bit of an actual versus a predicted one over here. And you can see um, that we should have had about 59 pounds per acre of uh, uh, potash, uh, 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 sorry, phosphorus in the soil, and we ended up with 107. And over here, 
we had 117 in our actual uh, potassium, but it was uh, supposed to be 66. Okay, now the Itty Bitty Shitty Committee came back to me and they said, uh, but you're, uh, you, you added manure, so those aren't valid. So let's say that that's invalid, okay, because it's not science, right? Okay, so <clears throat> how many people in, say, the USDA, um, you know, in a, in a sort of a real research situation, would give a recycled chemical engineer from the University of South Carolina money if I said I wanted to do fertility studies? No, not that many, okay. So we had to figure out something else. So I heard about experiment.com. It's basically a site where academics can go and raise funds to do small experiments. You know, instead of getting millions and millions of dollars, you know, you can get a little bit. Um, and my VP for research said, okay, if you can raise $5,000, I'll give you another $5,000. Well, we, um, or you, if you raise X thousand, I'll give you the, the X thousand. So we went ahead and we raised $5,000 um, for our first thing. And it was how much fertilizer do we really need? And what was shocking was we raised this money in about 20 days. And Carl and I are looking at each other because we, we do a lot of volunteer work. We, sh we should have raised more money, right? <laughs> 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 you laugh. It's true. <laughs> okay. So... Basically, what happened was we, uh, we got a, 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 next to Highway 57. We've got, uh, this is about a 10-acre piece of land, and we got 40 plots, uh, basically um, 60, foot, uh, 60 foot by 90 foot. And we put these 40 plots in there, and we treat them. Uh, we've got four different treatments, uh, and essentially three different nitrogen treatments and then one separate potassium treatment. And so we've got large-scale replicated plots that Carl then comes in and um, uh, harvests. We were fortunate enough to have a plot combine. Anyone got a discount plot combine, please come and see me afterwards. I'd love to buy it off you. Seriously. Okay. All right. So, uh, but, but we went and did that. So we got some really good results of the wheat. Um, and then somebody said, well, you'll see it in the soybeans. Well, our soybeans came back, and all our soybeans behind the wheat, so we harvested the wheat in June, uh, planted the soybeans, and the soybeans came. Our yields on the soybeans were rock steady. And uh, so, um, by the way, the committee came back and said, well, this is just a glorified demonstration pr plot. So I, I don't know how I can, I can satisfy the committee. But... Anyway, Carl and I went back and did something audacious. We uh, went ahead and raised $20,000 in, in research. And some of you guys are here today uh, that supported it. So thank you very much. I think Arbacheta uh, rallied the troops. And I mean, I, I got like, you know, people who I didn't know and from Kansas and stuff sending me 500 bucks. I was like, oh, amazing. So. That was, that was absolutely fantastic. So we raised the money. Uh, so we've had now, this is our second, uh, we're, we're into year three. So we've had a wheat, soybean, and corn. Basically, um, the wheat followed a warm season cover crop that followed corn. So we planted corn um, in 2013 and put a warm season cover, planted our first wheat crop that we measured, uh, and then planted the soybeans cool season cover, and then corn, and that uh, corn into last year, 2016. So this is uh, what our yield results looked like. Um, it, for, for wheat, we had a really bad case of head scab, and um, we, we could see quite a significant yield response to nitrogen over there. I'm not sure what it would have looked like had we not had the head scab, but that's what it was. And it was there um, also, Carl doesn't farm a very large acreage. I think he had 350 acres. And I calculated afterwards that Carl would have made more money going to work for McDonald's and just not doing anything on that land. And I, you know, up till that point, I always thought farmers were these rich dudes with all this land and these big trucks and equipment. And that kind of grounded me, and I, I said, I was just absolutely shocked. And so I've been a little bit obsessed about input costs for farmers since then. Um, but the experimental design was looking at 
the land grant university recommendations versus uh, uh, you know a, a cut rates. And so this is what we had for the nitrogen and then for our uh, uh, nitrogen for wheat and then for our corn in 2017. Oh come on now. Oh, there we go. Corn in 2017. What you saw was also a, a reasonable amount of yield um, for, uh, for the, the nitrogen input. Uh, what, what I would say is our cover crop was awful. Um, we had some really bad flooding and it was really cold. So the cover crop really never made it out of the gate. This year should be a slightly better year for cover crops. But you can see, you know, we, we got a, a, decent, a, a decent yield response. But uh, one of the things we noticed, I mean, we, we produced 117 pounds of uh, bushels for 50 pounds. Um, and we'll talk about the uh, uh, 50 pounds of nitrogen. And I'll talk about that later because we had a number of check strips as well. What did the check strips produce with zero N, zero P, zero K? So I was really excited to hear what, what Gabe uh, and the guys were talking about. Let's go ahead and have a look at our potassium response. Uh, keep in mind that we haven't applied any phosphorus over here uh, for over two years. Um, so, uh, and part of that is because our soil test phosphorus is high and for some or other reason we, we haven't mined it out. I sometimes joke with Carl and say, Carl uh, probably goes out at night and fertilizes when nobody's looking, but he hasn't admitted to that. In our part of the world, we're inculcated to believe that potassium, if you don't put potassium on, especially on these soils that are rated as medium, these are sandy, loamy sands, you're going to lose out on yield. Well, have a look at those numbers over there. Our wheat, uh, we can see, we actually, statistically, there's absolutely no difference. Uh, we had no uh, uh, yield or economic response from wheat. We had... The soybean that followed it, we had no change in yield. And in the corn, we, we saw very little. In fact, I'm thinking that there might have been a little bit of a nitrogen uptake suppression from the potassium chloride that we added. There's a great work called The Potassium Paradox by Carl Mulvaney and Ellsworth um, from Illinois. I, I suggest you read it. But that's what we got over there. So. Uh, does it take an, econo uh, uh, an economics major or a rocket scientist or a soil scientist or an agronomist to figure we, we didn't make money on the potassium that year? Okay, uh, I guess it's really self-explanatory. Um, what we did uh, also, just to make sure we, you, you know, we were staying in the right ballpark, was we went in several times and monitored our plant tissue. This is for our corn last year. Um, this, is, this is my uh, graduate student, Gabe, and you can see we haven't applied plant tissue, uh, we hadn't, haven't applied uh, phosphorus for two years. Do you think we need any phosphorus there, guys? Do you think phosphorus is uh, dependent on how much P we put in there? I, I don't think so, okay? Uh, our nitrogen, you can definitely see that yield response. And from what I've been hearing today, maybe if we changed varieties that were more mycorrhizal, we might see um, less response to, to nitrogen inputs. And you can see our plant tissue potassium was all above that critical level. So this is our full treatment where we had the full nitrogen plus potassium treatment. And this was where we had the full nitrogen treatment. And yet, at the end of the day, we got no yield response um, from, from any of those inputs. But our tissue tests bore out that, you know, we, we weren't doing something silly in between. Um, one of the stories, I guess, that carries over from our Conservation Innovation Grant is this whole idea of, Man, you're mining your soils. Mr. Carl, Mr. Carl, you're mining. So I, I work with about six or seven farmers, and the narrative they get from their neighbors and the fertilizer dealers are, what, what's the narrative? Three, one, two, three, four. Four words. Maybe five words. But you're mining your soils, okay? You're mining your soils. So here's what I did. In this case, we didn't add manure and for 20 sites, or 20 of my plots, not sites, 20 of the plots, our average 
soil test P was 114 pounds per acre. Um, we removed, based on our average yields, uh, uh, wheat 50 bushels, soybeans 40, and corn 145 bushels. We removed an average of 47 pounds per acre. So we should expect about 67 pounds of phosphorus in the soil. Well, actually what happened was we only dropped 28 pounds. And so we ended up, instead of with uh, 67, we ended up with 86 pounds per acre using Malik 1 extraction method. And what plant roots have ever seen a mixture of sulfuric acid and hydrochloric acid? Okay. <laughs> duh. Well, you know, I thought it was right three years ago, but I'm going, duh, what was I thinking? Okay. But anyway, we're using the language that we can relate to, you, you know, to our, uh, uh, um, d d back to, you know, the, what, what the land grant is seeing. But um, so we should have lost... Uh, you, you know, that difference is about 19 pounds of phosphorus or 44 pounds of P2O5 uh, fertilizer. And you can see our plant tissue tests or our yields didn't really show that we, we missed much. In terms of our uh, potassium, basically when we planted our wheat, we should have been on our last six pounds of potassium, guys. Sandy soil, right? You're mining your soils. Well, actually what happened okay, was actually we ended up, it did go down, but we ended up with 90 pounds per acre. Our wheat is looking great. We've, we've got wheat in the ground, and it's still looking great. So the difference was 84 pounds of potassium based on that top six inch of soils. Now this is Carl's favorite slide. It's called the build-up baloney slide, because what is the what is the narrative that you get? Fertilizer is money in the bank, right? Just think of it like a bank account. You're, just, you're putting that fertilizer in. Well, if you have a look over these last two years, the top blue line over here, what you see is we added 75 pounds and then 85 pounds of potash, okay? And you can see how much material that was. And here we added nothing. We actually yielded more out of these plots than out of these plots. <coughs> Difference? between beginning and end was three pounds per acre, and I don't think that's going to be s significant. So what are we doing when we're putting this stuff in? I don't know where it's going. Don't ask me. I, I, I'm, just, I'm just an aquatic scientist. But I do know that this is not money in the bank. Money in the bank, really? Like Gabe says, really? I need to practice. Really? Really? So that's kind of that's kind of one of our favorite slides. Uh, there's a guy called Marion Calmer, you know, Calmer cor Cornheads. There's a great, it's a six minute video. He's standing out, he's got plots out there, and he said, I've been putting uh, uh, strips of, of uh, phosphorus and potassium next to no phosphorus and potassium. And for 20 years, I had one year where I, it yielded, and, uh, it gave me an economic uh, response. It, it sometimes gives him a cosmetic response but it never gives him an, uh, an economic response. So that's kind of, I don't know how he farms, but that was like, wow, we're not alone in this, okay? Um, so that's, my friend Sonny Price is a buzz. I'm going to do my best Southern accent. He's a buzz. <coughs> I reckon everything we learned in ag school was wrong. And, uh, you know, what is that about? Because, I mean, this is a trusted institution. I'm, I'm not trying to bash ag schools. But what is going on over here? And so this has made us question a lot of things, including our sampling methods and everything else. But because the, these samples were analyzed, I didn't use Rick's because if I use Rick Haney's samples, they'll say, what, what would they say in South? Well, you're using Ray Haney's samples. His numbers are wrong anyway, right? <laughs> we're never going to, yeah, there we go. <coughs> we're never going to believe his samples. And I'll show you. Rick, if you remind me at the end, it's, it's, there's some really nice relationships between what Clemson and, and your, your numbers were. But so what questions has this made us ask? Because it's a head scratcher. We've been told the six inch soil test, life and death, that's how you do your fertilizer programs, right? So what questions has this made us ask? Well, the first question, are we measuring the right things? You know, are we measuring living soils versus the chemistry set? You know, Gabe's got a slide 
where he's, he's got him and his neighbor. Well, I've got the same with Farmer Carl. So this is Farmer Carl over here. Uh, he's outstanding in his field, by the way. Um, and uh, his neighbor over there. So Carl, for now, just over three years, this is our CIG field. This was his warm season cover, and uh, we'd had our first frost in December. <coughs> so, um, so, and then the neighbor has no tilt, but basically soybeans and cotton for who knows the last 20 years. But this field looked a little bit like this. So what happened was uh, Carl took a sample a, a, a year ago, and Carl um, put it in his, it, it was a wet day, he put it in his truck and he drove from Columbia to, uh, from, from Dillon to Columbia, which is two hours, and his truck rides a bit rough. And, and this sample looked like that when it got in the truck. And uh, man, he, caught, he took a picture, he said, Buzz, th that soil looks like diarrhea. So, <laughs> <coughs> okay, let, let me ask you, because, you know, Gabe said, oh man, you know, this is Gabe Brown. Oh, you know, I don't know anything, or not I don't know anything, it's like, you know, I'm just a really simple guy. But guys, look at this. Do we need a degree in soil science to figure out where we want to farm over here? <laughs> Come on, guys, right? So this is, you know, this is kind of, um, this is why some of Ray's uh, slate tests have such a great impact, and this is my little thing. So no PhD is required over here. And so are we measuring, the, the, the next que the question is, are we measuring the right things, a living soil versus a chemistry set? Because if you look at the chemistry set method over here, you know, uh, the, the neighbor possibly has a better soil. Now, in, interesting, the neighbor's been keeping up with his nutrients. Man, he, he puts those nutrients down, he limes it, he, he puts it down. Carl hasn't applied a sausage in, except nitrogen. He hasn't applied a sausage for three years. Okay, now l look at the difference over there. Um, but you could argue that the neighbor's got slightly better soil just to add a little bit more phosphorus, right? So we took that sample and split it and sent it up to Dr. Haney's lab. Which, and Haney's lab is always wrong, right? Okay, look, look at the difference there. The neighbor on even, even on nitrates, on every category, Carl's land is double what the neighbor's land is, and this is after three years. Um, uh, um, Michael Thompson, three years. Carl Coleman, three years. Three years, it's a measurable difference. Are we measuring the right things? If you are treating your soil like a chemistry set, like an inert medium to grow plants or to put houses, it's going to look like this, like the diarrhea, okay? So, it's again, it's up to you over there. So, are we measuring the right things? That's the question. I, I was, <coughs> I was, I've been taken up by Dr. David Johnson's idea of this, this fungus to bacterial ratio, and I took my first samples and sent them off to, to ward labs for PLFA. Should we be looking more at this? You know, and that's, you know, that's something I'm going to have to persuade my farmers to do, or at least experiment with. Should we be looking at that fungal to bacterial ratio? If that's the thing that is affecting our, our plants and the way they grow, gosh, we should, be, we, we should at least give that a fair shake. Who's interpreting the soil test? Now, what we did, this is, uh, this is let me have a look. I'm, Gonna I'm going to fall off these steps. This is our these are our plots over here. So we, we, we took a site where we had a, a, a sand, a loamy sand, and a sandy loam. We took three buckets, lots of soils, mixed them up, split them into nine soil samples uh, uh, from each bucket, Th sent three soil samples from each of the buckets to a separate lab. And these are the results we came, uh, we came, uh, we came back with. The recommendations, I didn't, I didn't worry about the, the, the measurements themselves, but the recommendations, the commercial lab, uh, the, the two land-grant university labs came back with no recommendation for phosphorus. The commercial lab came back with uh, that. And you can see the commercial lab said, you know, lay it on thick with the uh, uh, potassium, 
And then the two land grants kind of back and forth on that. And the Lyme recommendations as well. The resultant difference was something like uh, that was $62 an acre. Exactly the same soil samples sent to different labs. Uh, I was really delighted to see uh, Dr. Brad Jorn, he's an agronomist with Purdue, uh, has a, a talk on the difference in land-grant university um, recommendations. And he said one of the differences between, you know, um, he's got an instance where if you had land on this side and land on that side of the border, your difference in fertilizer cost would be something like $200,000 for 1,000 acres. And that's just because based on the ego of whoever built up that fertilizer recommendation. So part of this is when we say precision farming, the precision is, I, I'm not worried about the precision in the way the guys are measuring it, but the precision, uh, there's no precision in what that fertilizer recommendation is. So you can do, use precision equipment to make the wrong recommendation out there, okay? And so be careful of that precision farming moniker. Be careful how that's applied because it might be excellent technology but applying the wrong science. I hope I haven't offended anyone yet. Um, <laughs> the, the second, the, the other question we have to ask is how deep are our soils? Because the narrative our guys get is, oh man, you've only got 100 pounds an acre of potassium. This is sandy soils. We need to put 250 units of potassium if you're going to grow corn, because that corn's not going to, you know. And uh, we started looking, um, and I, I kind of took these uh, at 0 to 6, 6 to 12, uh, 12 to 18, 18 to 24 inches over here. Uh, our phosphorus came out. I was kind of shocked how much phosphorus we had in the 6 to 12 inch range. And then over here with the potassium, basically, we found that in our sandy soils, for every 100x of potassium in the top 6 inches, I had another 300x uh, potassium in the uh, uh, 6 to 24 inch range. We confirmed that with another 24 samples across the coastal plain of South Carolina. But uh, I, I told these guys that, you know, uh, uh, Sonny and Tony, uh, Sonny and Alan, I said, you guys are probably never going to have to apply phosphorus uh, in your lives again. Now they've been at it for two years, and uh, they still haven't right, run out of phosphorus according to our tissue tests. So uh, the, the third thing we want to ask is, are we measuring at, oh, sorry, we've already asked that, but are we measuring at the right depth? Now this is a head scratcher, we don't know, Nick, this is the soil test nitrates. We've, we've gone out to a friend of mine, Jason's farm, uh, 0 to 6, uh, 6 to 12, 12 to 24, and 24 to 36 inch. Look at how much nitri nitrate, just nitrate nitrogen we have. Now, we've, we've done that site three times. It's a head scratcher for me and Rick, uh, so Rick and I are going to look at that. But if that's the case, if he had roots that went three, three foot down there, Gosh, uh, maybe that explains why we're growing um, radishes the size of base baseball bats, Steve, right? Okay, duh. Okay, it's just, it just never occurred to me. I thought soils were only six inch deep and we were farming in a flower pot. That's what Dr. Ray Wiles says. He says, man, if you think you're farming in six inches, you're farming in a flower pot. All right, <clears throat> interesting enough, I also just looked, I, I had Rick analyze my water extractable organic nitrogen. We had 20, 28 pounds in that top six, uh, six inches, but the, in the six to th uh, 36 inch range, we had another um, 30 pounds per acre of water extractable organic nitrogen. So if we can get our plants to go down to three foot and starting to start to tap into those resources, how wonderful is that? And I think possibly this is what's happening in, in Gabe's land. Um, first, first of all, I'm an aquatic scientist, and I've been teaching aquatic sciences, I don't know, since about, um, I think, 1998. And, and I, this is the slide that I used to use 10 years ago, or five years ago, for what a cover crop should be. That, that's a cover crop, right? And, and my, in my head, a cover crop was this sort of a thousand pounds per acre of biomass, and that was it. Uh, today, 
I was, uh, two years ago, I was in my friend's tractor. This is uh, 10,000 pounds per acre. Um, uh, whoop, let's go back. 10,000 pounds per acre. We took plant tissue tests. This is raw, 300 pounds per acre raw nitrogen, 300 pounds per acre raw potassium in that, in that uh, sample. Uh, I have to believe that at least some of that comes back into the system. By the way, his soil test only in the top six inches, his soil test only comes out at about 100 pounds an acre. So where did that 300 pounds an acre come from? So are we accounting for nutrients in our cover crops? And uh, so that's something that we also have to include, or that I've, I've tried to include. Um, and so the question is, can we afford to ignore this whole resource? This is that very same cover crop. Look at, um, this is four inches, I believe. He had a four-inch mat, and that's his seed, seed trench. That's the slot where he planted his corn. <laughs> so does, does Palmer Amaranth have any kind of chance coming up through that? So can we afford to ignore the whole resource in terms of, number one, uh, above ground biomass, and, uh, and that was a low average that year, zero to six inch, and then our six to 24 inch. So when our farmers started to see, this is my resource before I throw a single pound of fertilizer out there, that started to transform the way they looked at the soil. Ray, what, did it, what is it? The way you do, this, do things, you change the way you do things or the way you see things. And so this, 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 the process that we've been going through, you know, you can see the lights come on in these guys' minds, but it's the way you see things. Can we afford to ignore the whole resource? And certainly, I know what my answer is. Um, really, what our what our goal is to, is to go to zero in P and K. We've basically, on 12,000 acres on the coastal plain, now stopped applying P two years ago, and this year we've stopped applying K. We're hoping uh, to go to, to pull back on, the, the, uh, on nitrogen as well. But what was interesting is last year, again, this is a sandy, a loamy sand soil, so it's much lighter than the soils you guys have. You had 21 plots, and uh, his average corn yield for 21 plots where, where he had 0 N, 0 P, 0 K, it was 95 bushels. Um, and, and that's th after three years of cover cropping, which, uh, which kind of shocked me, which kind of surprised me, but uh, um, uh, uh, delighted me as well. I'm going to leave with this last slide. I think, <laughs> Gabe, you know this one. Christine Jones if you uh, go to the Fuller Field School on Vimeo and you, you listen to Christine Jones, she talks about carbon and the mycorrhizal connection. And this was her first slide, and I was really, really captured by that. But she says, uh, we, we had a drought in Australia, and you can see here's some wheat, and you've got wheat on this side and wheat on that side, and what's happening in the middle? So what is happening in the middle over there? Old fence row, you guys are too smart for me. Her, her farmers were saying, what, what did she put out there? That's an old fence row. This, this soil has been farmed no-till for 20 years, so they haven't tilled it. And yet, you know, with all the you know, chemicals and herbicides and fertilizer, that's what it produced. And basically, the thing that struck me, she said, where's the drought? The drought's over here and here, but there's no drought here. And that really struck me. Um, and... I want to end, end this talk, uh, and we'll probably look at those Haney slides off afterwards. But basically the thing, um, uh, I, I read this in Acres USA, basically what Christine Jones is saying is our soil, f all our soil fertility recommendations, are ba because we scientists, we don't want interference. We don't want confounding factors, right? So the best way to do that is you take a soil, you put it in a pot, but you, you sterilize it or you mix it up and you kill everything in because you don't want all those nasty, confounding biological factors, right? <laughs> Biology is pretty hard to measure, right? And so we're measuring a fertilizer response in dead soils and that's what we're basing our fertilizer recommendations on. 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago when we were tilling our soils to death, maybe those were good approximations 
But when you're going from, say, 1% uh, uh, to 6% organic matter, and everything that's in that organic matter with the mycorrhizal fungi, I don't know that those fertilizer, uh, uh, those, the basis, the scientific basis for those fertilizers work. And so um, I, I, I'm just going to end off with that. I think we have a tremendous amount of work to do. I suspect, though, the initiative's not going to come from the land-grant universities. The initial initiative's going to be coming from guys like you. Gabe said, you know, if, you're, if your guy doesn't talk to you about carbon, fire him and find someone who's going to talk about biology, carbon, mycorrhizal, fungi. And so probably, Gerard, we, we need to figure out a way to, to get more guys like you and me out there. So ladies and gentlemen, that's, that's really all I wanted to share with you. Um, and we'll go into questions. Thank you very much. Any questions? Yes, sir. Um, no. The, the nutrient levels, those are malic 1, um, and that the, the, the potassium for malic 1 was in the medium level. So our averages was, were about 120. Sufficient starts at 150. Yeah. Uh, I've got a that Yeah. Yeah. Right, typically you're going to find that. Have you, have you farmed on it yet? Have you? Uh, okay, because normally what we actually find, the, the, the conventional fertility is not all that great or often horrible, and yet it does very, very well. At least that's been our experience. And that's because those nutrients are tied up in, in microbes. Um, so our experience has been that after CRP, fields do really, really well, and then they drop off. I don't know if that was your experience. The other thing is, remember, we're using Malik 1, Malik 3, Bray, uh, Olsen. These are essentially uh, chemical compounds, hydrochloric acid, sulfuric acid. Plants have, plant roots have never seen those things, and we, we say those are plant available. Uh, what really has happened, uh, perhaps something else, um, is uh, we've been doing plant tissue tests on a number of sites, where our, for instance, phosphorus range from 16 pounds per acre to over 200 pounds per acre. Our plant tissue phosphorus came back rock steady. So there's very little literature that's, that relates soil test values to actual plant tissue values. And so what you've got in that CRP land is you've got this beautiful mycorrhizal network that's going out and forming these relationships and bringing the soil back to you. Um, you know, we're, as farmers, we, we, we have learned to tolerate degraded lands, and it's a little bit like telling Walmart that you're gonna, you guys have to tolerate 35% efficiency. Walmart does just, just, uh, just in time inventory, and lands are like that as well. They don't have to store, you know, 60 pounds per acre of nitrogen in, in the, uh, or of nitrate nitrogen that gets made of, made available little by little in that soil system. So our soil systems are very good and very efficient at recycling those nutrients. And if you talk to these guys, I, I had a good talk uh, with David, and I don't know if Alan's here this morning, but you know about this whole feedback system, as your soils get better and better and better, they need less nutrients. One of the things that we modeled uh, uh, the way we do work, uh, Gabe has not really been applying nutrients for the last 20 years. His nutrient concentrations, according to the soil test numbers, have gone down, but his plant tissue numbers are going up. And why is that? 90% of, uh, um, uh, of nutrient uptake is microbially facilitated, and that means you've got to have carbon. Carbon is the soil's energy currency. So I hope that answers your question to some extent. <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. Yes, sir. Yeah. 
Yeah. When do you recommend winning your life? <clears throat> okay, so the question was, you, you know, a lot of guys have just gotten into this. When do you start winning yourself off these things? My answer is I don't really, I couldn't tell you. What I would tell you, though, is why don't you start putting check strips wherever you are if you're really worried about fertilizer? Put check strips in and start, uh, you know, it, it might be as simple as putting a tarp out on a 20 by 20 foot area. Flag that off, take plant tissue sa samples where you didn't, uh, where you didn't uh, apply it, nutrients versus where you did and see what comes up. So put check strips in, don't just do one, do a bunch of them. Uh, and, and really, uh, information for the farmer is, is power. So, so do your own plant tissue tests. Um, you know, there's a lot of literature out there that, that gives us the actual plant tissue test standards as well. So, that, so my answer would be try and start as soon as possible so you're paying for your cover crop. Carl basically has saved $60 an acre uh, after he's paid for his cover crop seed on nutrients, lime, and subsoiling. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I think that's a great idea. We do do tissue tests. We, um, we've got a, there's a little company called Farm Shots. It's an upshot start company from Duke, and they sell their NDVI imagery at 50 cents an acre. And so we have started to use uh, cover crops as a, a, a way to start looking at where are our bad spots. And so... Um, we're not quite sure what to do with those bad spots except apply manure, but I'm, I'm hoping we can figure out, you know, in a 50 field acre, there might only be two acres of bad spot. Yes, sir? The follow up to that is yeah. If you are using them as indicators yeah. and you also use your covers, you target certain nutrients during them. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Again, I'm, I'm unconvinced that, um, unless it's a really degraded soil, I'm unconvinced that a particular nutrient deficiency is because that nutrient is deficient in the soil. It might be a symptom. If we put our, that particular nutrient in, we're fixing the symptom, you know, in, in, in an inorganic form. But I, I'm thinking oats and they're very Yeah, yeah. Th that is that would be that that would be my understanding. Yes. So, so, so I, I don't know if there's someone that you know. I'm kind of getting you know what mix if you're if you're doing tissue tests. Yeah, yeah. And and you're finding that your plants are you know deficient in something. Yeah. Is there a certain mix that you can? Okay, I see what you're saying. Um, I, I would not be able to, you know, I've heard guys doing with phosphorus, uh, they, they're putting in something, uh, a mix with buckwheat, for instance, to stimulate that mycorrhizal growth. Um, I would say, um, you know, as a rule, those cover crops are going to go down into the subsoil. In our part of the world, potassium would be an issue. Uh, and so we think that they're bringing those, uh, those up uh, from the subsoil closer to the surface. But maybe speak to some of your cover crop guys. I, I do think, though, that making phosphorus more available is, uh, you know, those, those species that encourage mycorrhizae. Summer species, you know, uh, the, the uh, sorghum sedan grass uh, and, and uh, the sunflowers, we've found have been pretty good at that as well. The other thing is uh, be careful when you're measuring your soil test phosphorus because your soil microbes are going to go to sleep, and we've found a 50 to 60 percent increase between a January measurement and a, and a May measurement in South Carolina. So try and measure your soil, soils at more or less at the same time of the year. We've settled for measuring in November and, and kind of keeping it there. But it's not going to be fair on your pea, but we've, we've, pea is a non-issue for us. A couple of pieces of literature that you might, or on, online, the potassium paradox, if potassium is something you're worried about, and look up legacy phosphorus. Legacy phosphorus and the potassium paradox, you might find a, quite a bit on that. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Have you ever, have you thought about introducing livestock into this and seeing what your 
in, incessantly, incessantly. I just got to get my row crop farmers to go there. Carl has said to me, this coming year we're going to introduce livestock. Yeah, yeah. I think, um, you know, being in the commodities business is, is really a losing game, and uh, we really have to try and figure out how to, to get better. Not, you know, we're, we, we don't want to make typewriters more and more efficiently because typewriters eventually are going to go out of fashion as well. Yes, sir? Yes, sir. And then we start depending on our mycorrhizal fungus yep. stuff on a dry year, are they not going to be a lot more that should be more inactive and maybe not release as much that we may need a higher base test? I'm just throwing that out there. I, I don't know. So, what, let's say we experience a dry, a dry year. year and we're relying on our microorganisms. Yes. Oh, I, I see what you... Would we need, you know, could we possibly need a little higher base level test on a year that's dry? Yeah. In other words, would you, would you need more fertilizer in a dry year to make those nutrients of it more? Yeah, you would need, yeah. If you apply it, you're probably that year, you're probably counterproductive. Right. Maintaining a little higher base level so it's better. Oh, I see what you mean. Well, I, I believe in the build-up baloney principle. I don't believe, I think there is no, I'm not seeing build-up in these soils. And Mr. Calmer, Mr. Calmer from Illinois has really said he can't tell the difference between where he's applied P and K for the last 20 years. So I, I, I would not r recommend putting in any more baseline P or K. I'd say don't fertilize for two years down the line. Just fertilize for this year. That's, that's going to cost you enough, yeah. Yeah. Mine was more of a try and maintain a minimal application to see what the yield is going to be. Yeah. 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 Yeah.